I found this book a very long time ago, and at the time when I found it, it was out of print. It was written in the 1960s by a man named Casey Pillai. <clears throat> he was uh, born in India, raised a Hindu, converted to Christianity. And his mission was to teach the Western world of Eastern traditions uh, so that the scriptures could be understood by us here in the West. It's a really neat book. We'll read chapter one. Americans and Europeans are shocked to learn that in many parts of the East, marriages are still being arranged by parents, just as they have been for centuries past. But in spite of the seeming lack of freedom of choice involved in the system, there is a notable lack of divorce, and the children resulting from these unions do not become juvenile delinquents. Let us examine some of these customs as revealed in the Holy Scriptures, for the Bible abounds with parables and figures of speech relating to them. First, there is the matter of selecting the bride. Careful parents give much thought to this. They avoid selecting a girl such as described in Isaiah. <clears throat> Isaiah 3.16 Moreover, the Lord saith, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty, and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes, walking and mincing as they go, and making a tinkling with their feet. The stretched forth neck is a sign of pride and arrogance which the parents watch for. You may remember that Paul instructed the women of the early church to adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefastness, 1 Timothy 2.9. I do not like that word shamefastness, which the King James translators used in this verse. A better word might be humility. This is a quality parents look for in a prospective bride for their son. The tinkling with their feet refers to the many jewels which oriental women wear about their ankles. The modest girl will walk carefully, so that these jewels will not jingle as she walks, but the haughty ones will make a noise with them. Another factor which is considered is whether the prospective bride has wrinkles upon her brow. Oriental women, whatever age they may be, pride themselves on their calm, composed demeanors. Since they believe that a worried-looking face betrays a lack of faith in God, this makes more significant Paul's remark in Ephesians 5.27 that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That is, your faith will have been so great that you will have no wrinkle on your face from worry or lack of trust in God. In Job 16.8, Job says to his miserable comforters, And thou hast filled me with wrinkles, which is a witness against me, and my leanness rising up in me beareth witness to my face. If the parents of the pr prospective groom notice lines of worry on the girl's face, they say to themselves, Look how she has worried herself already. She will worry our son to death if she is married to him, and this candidate will be rejected. The bride having finally been chosen, the two families are now ready to conduct the betrothal ceremony. This is a solemn occasion. The two families may eat a supper together, and then <clears throat> they will go out into the garden. In many parts of Persia, Arabia, Syria, and India, gardens have sacred plants, and one of these is the Kichalika tree, an exotic and fragrant species of orange which bears fruits as large as grapefruit. It is a beautiful tree, and its sweet scent can be detected at a distance during the time the fruit is ripe. A carpet is spread, and the girl's mother leads her out of the house to be seated opposite the prospective groom. She is, of course, veiled, since it is considered improper for the groom to look upon the face of the bride before the wedding ceremony has been performed. Easterners who observe this custom believe that the veil is a woman's God-given protection. Even a thief will not attack a woman with a veil, because he believes that in doing so he attacks God himself. You may remember that in Genesis 24, 64, and 65, Rebekah, lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. For she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. The young couple are now seated facing each other, 
on the carpet. And the prospective bride cups her hands and holds them, pressed together toward the young man, and he drops into her hands the ten pieces of silver. These coins have been handed down and kept in the family for this purpose. On one side, there is a coat of arms of the young man's family. On the other side is imprinted the year in which they were made. These oriental girls are taught, he who places the ten pieces of silver in your hand is he who will love you. They believe that God kindles love in the heart of the girl at the moment these ten pieces of silver are dropped into her hands. This, then, is the beginning of love under the sacred Kichilika tree. <clears throat> Read now with me the fifth verse of the eighth chapter of the Song of Solomon. Song of Solomon 8, 5. Who is this that cometh up from the wilderness, leaning upon her beloved? I raised thee up under the apple tree. There thy mother brought thee forth. There she brought thee forth that bare thee. Unfortunately, the translators never saw or heard of a sacred kichilika tree, so they did the best they could by putting the word apple. <clears throat> Apples are botanical latecomers in the earth and were not in existence until a few hundred years ago. By receiving the ten pieces of silver, the bride is considered to have now been purchased. Just as Christ died for us on the tree and purchased us as the bride is purchased, you are bought with a price, 1 Corinthians 6.20. Christ paid the price for us. The bride also receives gifts of other jewels at the betrothal ceremony, but none of the others will have the significance which pieces of silver have for the bride. Although they would have a value of only about 14 cents each if they were melted and sold for the metal, still there is a terrific symbolical importance to them. She will wear them hooked with little hooks into her hair at the wedding ceremony, and she must guard them with her life thereafter. You remember the parable which Jesus told about the woman who lost one of her ten pieces of silver? Luke 15, 8 and 9. How this parable has been misunderstood by the Western world, which does not appreciate the importance of this oriental belief. Scholars have tried to say that this woman was poor and needed the money, so she swept the house... <clears throat> And upon finding the coin, called in the neighbors to rejoice and so forth because she needed the money. According to Eastern thinking, if a woman loses one of her ten pieces of silver, God has withdrawn favor from the household and the blessings which they formerly have had been lost. If she cannot find the coin, she will have to be put out in the street, an outcast, put out to die. No wonder the poor woman desperately swept the house until the coin was found and called in the neighbors to rejoice with her, for she had just been saved from extinction. And Jesus said, Their rejoicing is like the rejoicing in heaven when one sinner repents. The marriage ceremony lasts ten days, since it is considered a sacrament. All the neighbors join in its observance. Any programs, any prayers and fasting which have been in progress are suspended for the ten days since they believe that God's presence is there at the marriage ceremony. Fasting can mean going without food. It also means doing the will of God. If any man has a quarrel with another at this time, he must go and ask for forgiveness so that he may present himself blameless before the Lord. This situation is described in Matthew. Matthew 9, 15. And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. Children in this verse means people. The children of Israel were grown-up people. I am 60 years old, but still I am a child of God. This way of referring to people has caused much confusion to Bible scholars. This verse is referring then to the custom of suspending prayers and fasting during the marriage ceremony period. But when this is completed, they may then resume any prayers or fasting they had in progress. In the 25th chapter of Matthew, <clears throat> another interesting Eastern custom is described. I refer to the parable of the ten virgins. Matthew 25, 1-12 Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, who took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps, and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, 
Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out and meet him. Then all the virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they were that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. In many parts of the East today, the custom of the ten bridesmaids going out to meet the bridegroom's party <clears throat> is still practiced. You see, many of the towns are surrounded by walls, and at the gates of the town there is an inn for travelers. In this inn, there is also a special apartment for bridesmaids to use while waiting at the gates for the bridegroom's party. The torches which they carry, not lamps, are very special ones, made especially for the purpose and carefully handed down in the family from one generation to the next. So here are these ten bridesmaids waiting at the inn by the gate for the bridegroom and his party to arrive. Tradition says they must arrive just at midnight, and this is exactly what the scripture reports. One of the groomsmen goes on ahead a little to announce their coming by blowing a horn at the gates of the town. The foolish virgins now wake up and realize that they have no oil in their lamps. They even make up a good excuse to tell the other virgins. Our lamps are gone out, they said, even though it says a few verses before this that they brought no oil with them at all. We must realize that Jesus is ter telling a parable when he says five of the virgins were foolish and failed to bring oil for their torches. I was raised in the midst of a culture which still practices this tradition, and I have never heard of a girl failing to have oil for her torch. It would be unthinkable for her to do so. But Jesus tells the story in this way to illustrate that the oil represents the spirit and the light which we have within us when we accept Christ as our personal savior. We must have that spirit within us if we expect to be admitted into the master's gates with the rest of the wedding party. If we have not experienced salvation, then we shall be like the foolish virgins of the parable who were told by the Lord, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. In addition to the special wedding torches, there are special wedding robes which are worn by the guests. These are also handed down in the family and are decorated with certain laces and ornaments denoting the house and lineage of the wearer. A parable concerning these is recorded in Matthew, Matthew 22, 11 through 13. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in here hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Western scholars have a terrible time trying to understand the full meaning of this parable. A professor at Drew, Drew Theological Seminary challenged me about this scripture once. He said, What kind of king would cast out this guest who had no garment? Perhaps he had could the king not have loaned the guest a garment? Or if he forgot the garment and left it at home? I would, if I were he, put him in my car and take him home so that he could get it. Wouldn't this be more Christ-like and forgiving? These are all very good questions. Again, the answer is very simple. Once the oriental custom is understood, in the parable, it is said that this is the wedding of a king's son. Matthew 22, 2. <clears throat> The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king, which made a marriage for his son. In the case of the marriage of a king's son, you see, the wedding is not held at the bride's home, as in the case of ordinary people, but is held at the palace. In addition, each guest receives a special wedding robe from the king to wear for the occasion, a robe with the royal seal which is sent to the home of the guest a day or two in advance of the wedding so that he may be properly attired. It would be an unpardonable breach of etiquette to appear in one's own wedding garment after having received the royal robe. Think about how much worse it would be for the guest to appear, as in the parable, with no garment at all. How did the guest get into the wedding without the robe in the first place? This is a question which is sometimes asked me. Well, when the guests arrive for the wedding, they come first to a sort of porch where there is a tub of water. And a servant is in attendance, so the guests may wash their feet after having walked in the dusty pathways. The guests 
fling off their sandals in the direction of the servant, and he is expected to catch them. He holds a very humble and lowly position in the household which he serves. A reference to the contempt with which this task is held is expressed in Psalms 108.9. Moab is my washpot. Over Eden, Eden will I cast out my shoe. This should be sandal. Shoes were not worn in those days. This lowly servant, the one who has sandals flung at him, then would have no authority in the household to challenge a guest who might come without a rope. After washing the feet, the guests pass into a room of the house in which another servant awaits. The task of this servant is to sprinkle rose water on the head and body of the guests. He, like the first servant, has no authority to challenge a guest who might not be properly attired. It would not be until the guests had gone into another room to be greeted by the host with an holy kiss that the guest without a wedding robe would be discovered. The scripture says the guest was speechless, and well he might be, since he had been given every chance to be attired in the acceptable raiment for the wedding, but he deliberately refused to put on the royal robe. He was no foreigner. He knew the custom. Therefore the king gave him no second chance and had him cast out. God in like manner sent us a robe of righteousness in his son. If we accept the robe, if our heart puts on the robe, then we wear the garment of salvation. We must put on Christ in order to appear blameless before God. Many people today have been sent the robe of righteousness, but refuse to put it on. They are truly tied hand and foot, spiritually speaking, and have been cast into outer darkness. I think people of the Western world grope in even greater darkness than the people of the East. There are so many people in the East who have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, but surely there is greater darkness for the people of the world to whom Christ has been preached and they have refused him. As we said before, the marriage ceremonies in some cases last for 10 days, and each of the 10 virgins has a special day upon which she performs a certain function. The bride and groom come together for perhaps half an hour each day and are seated on a specially decorated chair to listen to instruction which the priest gives to them. They have heard these instructions before, but now they are rehearsed and called to their minds again upon this sacred and solemn occasion. Finally, on the tenth day, the vows are repeated. The groom promises, promises to love and cherish his wife forever. The bride promises to accept the husband in her life in place of God, to obey and serve just as she would the Lord himself. Whatever he does or decides for them is right, whether anyone else thinks so or not. Paul took note of this in his first letter to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 7.34 There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world how careth for the things of the world how she may please her husband. Now salt is brought And they each take a piece of it and put it on their tongue, saying, In the name of the salt, I agree to do all that I have promised, so help me God. There is no wedding ring, as there is in the Western world. Instead, a silver cord is placed around the girl's neck. The groom may now lift the veil and view for the first time the wife whom he has married, having never known her before. He slowly raises the veil with fear and trembling, I suppose, and places it upon his shoulder. This symbolizes that the girl's God-given protection is now on his shoulder. Her care and protection are now his responsibility, and he is therefore as God to her. This is the meaning of the phrase in Isaiah 9-6, And the government shall be upon his shoulder. Christ bought us for a price, and as our bridegroom, he has taken the responsibility for us on his shoulder. The vows now having been repeated, the people go in to the wedding feast. The young couple walk together into the hall where the feast is prepared, under a special canopy. This symbolizes the protection of God which is over them. It was at a wedding feast in Cana that Jesus performed his first miracle, that of changing the water to wine. John 2, 1-4 In the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, 
they have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. <clears throat> this last verse is a mistranslation. That is why it appears to make no sense in the context. It should be, Gracious mother, what concern of yours and mine? My turn is not yet come. This refers to the custom of supplying the sacramental, sacramental wine in order of age. The oldest persons there must first supply, and the younger ones later. Jesus, being 30 years of age at the time, was placed further down the line, and it was not yet his turn to provide the wine to the guests in the honor of the bride and bridegroom. As a matter of fact, fermented wine is never used in the parts of the East in which the marriage is considered a sacrament. This wine was, was doubtless grape juice, for in these marriages people never drink intoxicating beverages. One must judge according to the occasion described in the Bible as to whether it is speaking of wine or grape juice. John apparently includes this account of Jesus' first miracle in order to help establish the proof that Jesus was the Son of God and his authority to turn water into grape juice. As we said, marriage is a sacrament of the feast, and therefore no intoxicating beverages would be used in them. The wedding feast completed, the couple now goes on the honeymoon. Unlike a Western couple, the Oriental couple do not immediately live together as man and wife. They wait for a certain date, which has been set by the priest, who, after consulting the stars, fixes a date for them to come together. It is thought that the child will have the characteristics of this star. This explains the puzzling remark in Matthew 1.18. When asked his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Westerners have tried to say that they were only engaged at this point. Not so. They were married all right. They had just not come together. In Matthew 1.20, the angel says to Joseph, Fear not to take the, unto thee Mary thy wife. The honeymoon lasts for 12 months. The couple lives one month with first the bride's parents and then the next month with the grooms. They take all their meals together. In the east, if a man is invited to dinner, within one year of his wedding day, he will reply, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. Luke 14, 20. Europeans and Americans think <clears throat> that this is just a flimsy excuse indeed. But this is not a flimsy excuse at all. To take a meal away from home and away from the wife during the first year would be unthinkable. It is simply not done. At the end of the 12-month period, another solemn ceremony is enacted. The couple has spent the last month in the home of the bride's parents. The family and friends and as many of the bridesmaids as can be located are gathered together for this occasion. The husband approaches the wife and makes a formal statement to her in the presence of all those assembled. He says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my father's house are many mansions, and if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may also be also. And whither I go, ye know, in the, in the way ye know. Doubtless these words are familiar to you. They are the words Jesus spoke to his disciples at the Last Supper, John 14, 1-4. The couple will now make their permanent residence in the home of the father of the husband. He must go and prepare an apartment in which they will make their quarters. They will eat with the rest of the family, but this apartment will be their private quarters. He is reassuring his bride that he is going to prepare their apartment and that he will in due time return for her so that she may be there with him also. The bride listens carefully to this solemn pronouncement and then she makes her response. She says, All that thou sayest I will do. I wonder why many Christians of today are not able to believe Christ's promise to us as calmly and joyfully as the bride of the East responding to her husband. I think it is because we do not know Christ as the bride knows her husband. They have been together for a year. They have not even accepted an invitation apart. If we who profess Christ would spend one year fully engrossed in the things of the Spirit, never taking a meal without prayer, and always thinking how we may please the Lord, we could believe his promises to us. We too could reply, All that thou sayest, I will do. And that was chapter 1.